uh, my pleasure to have uh, Rangit Khan, um, who is going to be giving a talk on, on his upcoming um, research paper. Um, Rangit is uh, using this forum um, to uh, give a practice talk that he will uh, he would be uh, recording and giving at the at the conference in uh, in November. So this is um, his uh, his practice run. Um, if you are able to give comments on the technical as well as you know presentation content, that's uh, that's very very welcome. Um, uh, if there is, um, if you have any questions that you would rather uh, type in the chat privately, please do so as well. Um, uh, thanks very much for being here. And with this, I would uh, like to um, uh, ask Rangit to go ahead and get started. Go ahead, Rangit, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajan. And I, actually, I was going to say the same uh, thing. It was a kind of a, uh, practice talk we are planning to the actual talk will be given in the ISA Kavasi conference on November unfortunately virtually. So this uh, topic of discussion is on the on decomposing a deep neural network module. This work has been published in the uh, ESA KVC 2020 and we are really excited to got to know that this paper won the ACM uh, 6 of Distinguished Paper Award. So before getting into the technical details and the, uh, about the paper, I'd like to, just a second. I'd like to introduce my, myself. So I am a third year PhD student from the Department of Computer Science. My advisor is this region. And during the last two years, I was uh, very fortunate to work with some of the uh, very beautiful people, directly and indirectly, Joey, Samantha, Hamish, Ramon, Ijia, C.B., Jiang, Muhammad, Saim, and Scott. Not that I'm uh, able to see in the in person for the last six months, and I hope they, are, they look the same as I saw them six months before. So, and also over the summer, I worked as a research intern at Microsoft Research. My mentor was Nachi Nagappan, and I collaborated with Vu Le uh, and Sumit Guluani from the program synthesis team, and the Shumendu Lairi from the uh, research and software engineering team. So, uh, giving, so right now we'll directly dive into the paper related discussion. So a modulating program in the giving a brief history is first let's talk about a little bit what is monolithic software. Uh, monolithic software is a software that without any component of pieces, it's a single entity. And when is the modular software is that when the software is divided into the component of pieces that can be utilized independently. And modularity is the process that decomposes a monolithic model into components or modules. So some of the key benefits of um, modularity is the independent development. And development can be done uh, without, uh, without uh, need from the change of the other components. And reusability, one of the key things, and modularity uh, enables the replacement. And in at uh, some point, uh, is, uh, does the independent testing also. So, this work uh, presents uh, the first step towards decomposing a monolithic deep neural network into module so that the components of the deep neural network can be used to create another network. That approach also takes the first step towards enabling the replacement of a feature and constant and also reusability. So before going into the deep neural networks and the decomposition, I want to uh, have this point and give us a very uh, high level disc uh, definition of the how deep neural network actually looks like. So deep neural network consists of uh, three different layers mostly. First one is input layer where the input is, uh, is uh, treated as a feature and then the hidden layer actually where the training happens. It consists of the nodes and edges. There is typically two types of edges. That is one that edges connect between the uh, layers and one is bias. Bias is the edge that uh, represent the strength among the, all the neurons within that layer. And output layer where the prediction happens is in, uh, at least in image recognition and the deep neural network specifically, this is uh, represented as a probability. So in current state, uh, the model can be built in two ways. 
first is the traditional learning uh, that from building model from scratch as let's take an example of english digit data set what happens here that uh, the developer takes the data set make a structure of the model and train the model with the data set and give give a trained model and predicts with that there is another way a model can be built that's called transfer learning in this transfer learning we the problem is that we have a mo trained model say x and we want to use that model for a different perspective or different uh, problems. So uh, typically what happens there is so many ways. Typically what happens is replacing the last layer and trained with a limited uh, data and we get a new model that can be, uh, that, that can be able to predict the uh, new problems. Now, we, uh, here we will be giving a couple of motivating examples so how it looks to have uh, is to reuse a part of the deep neural network and how developer does it how we are proposing it so for take an example like this same, same data set uh, with english digit what we want to build here uh, is a subset of the problem that uses 0 1 1 to uh, have a binary digit classifier so what developer will do? Developer will uh, partition the data set and take the zero and one and build a model structure and train a model. And what we are actually proposing here, instead of doing that, what will decompose the DNN model into small components. And our question, can we reuse the models from zero and one and to build a class, uh, classifier that can do a binary classification? Another reuse that is inter data set, the previous was intra data set uh, reuse. Here we have two classification problems one with the model with English digit and one with the English letters A to J. Just, uh, so, what we want to build here is a duodecimal classifier. Duodecimal classifier is actually 0 to 9 and AB. So, what developers here will do is take the English data set and merge with the A and B from the English letter data, uh, letter data set and uh, make a new data set and build a model and train the model. So instead of doing that, what we are proposing is that can we again decompose into smaller models, take all zero to nine modules from the English digit data set and A and B for English letter data set. And can we make a model um, uh, uh, problem uh, that can classify the duodecimal problem the classification. There's another uh, is, uh, aspect of modularity is replacement. So let's take an example. If we have a DNN model that is doing a satisfactory job for classifying 0 to 4 and 6 to 9, but could improve its performance for 5, could we take the logic for classifying 5 for another DNN model and replace the faulty 5 with a new part? So this is when uh, DNN model A has a faulty part and DNN model uh, B has uh, the part is working in a better way. So we want to replace the five with the uh, better model. So what developers will do here, realizing the replacement scenario in developer is really complicated. The developers might need to change the model structure of model A to match with the structure model B which is, has the potential to change the model's air effectiveness from zero to four and six to nine. Then they can replace the training samples for five used to train model A with those used to train model B. And finally, the modified model A would be trained with the modified training B. Instead of doing that, what we are trying to achieve here, we can decompose into smaller components and we just replace the component of uh, that can classify the digit five from the with the DNN model B module. So uh, this is the overall approach uh, of our work and it is illustrated in this figure. Uh, decomposing the uh, trend DNN model into modules. In this work, we focus on the DNN models for multi-level classification problem. We refer, we will refer to single black box DNN model for all class as monolithic model. Our approaches decompose this model into DNN modules, one for each level in the original monolithic model. 
A DNN model, uh, module accepts the same input as the monolithic mod model, but acts as the binary classifier. So in the example, uh, we'll go through this example with our approach. And here the goal is to, in the left far left hand side, we have a classification problem that can classify the input zero to two. It's our problem, uh, what we want to solve is that if we want to decompose into three deep neural model, module on the far right that can classify that an input is zero or one or two. So first is the constant identification. Constant, uh, this, uh, uh, the algorithm is uh, for the constant identification. I'll go into uh, more detail uh, with the illustrated example. So what constant uh, identification essentially identify those part of the monolithic model that contribute to a specific functionality or constant. To untangle the constant of output level, one could obtain a piece of deep neural network that can perform a certain task. For example, what we are doing here, like predicting us for a, a single class, and can hide the non-dominant constant to separate the constants. To illustrate we have this example, the monolithic model has three tangled constants from zero, one, and two. The goal of constant identifier step is to identify parts of the deep neural network that responsible for classifying an image into zero, one, and two. Once we identify the parts of the deep neural network related to the constant, those parts still might contribute to other constant as well. So let's see how we do it. So we take the model. We in, for, uh, for this, we will be uh, giving an example of the how we uh, identify the constant for the related to output class zero. We give the inputs related to output class. We get the which nodes are active and deactive in the sense that have. I mean, we have an assumption with this uh, approach right now is that we are using the a model with the real loop uh, activation. So based on that definition, we uh, give whether the node is active or inactive. So then we identify the edges incident to inactive. And our assumption is that if one node is inactive, there won't be any data flow or connection to that node. And also we identify the edges coming from inactive nodes and we remove those edges and to build a small uh, subgraph that can that has the only the connection that is related to the input zero. Now I'm uh, going into another uh, Till now, we have the functional constants. We have the uh, small subgraph that can classify 0, 1, and 2. Now, the problem here is that this problem is become a unary classification problem. So uh, irrespective of the input, the output will be for mod, mod, uh, module 0, it will be 0, or for 1, it will be 1, because there is no connection left for the other. So that's where the concept uh, is coming, like tangling identification. Tangling identifier certainly recognizes the part responsible other constant, while constant identification can separate the part of the network that contributes to a constant. It may not be able to uh, make the separate part function. Using constant identification, we identify A's that are responsible for particular constant. However, remaining network can classify a single constant as all the edges corresponding to other constant are removed or updated. And model predicts the dominant constant irrespective of the input that I told you earlier. Thus, the resulting network becomes a single classifier. This is akin to the removing the con uh, conditional and branch from a program that results in a subprogram that performs the functionality of the remaining branch, but does so unconditionally. To solve this problem, we uh, bring back some of the connection from the non-dominant constant. For example, for this module zero, the non-dominant constant will be one and two. And we do this, uh, we applied a couple of algorithms for doing so, and we'll briefly describe each of them in the upcoming slides. So first problem we do to mean do an imbalance. So how we do that? Uh, first, we take the model, uh, DNN model. We give the input related. Again, this example is for the building the mod module zero. 
info related to output class zero. So we get the, all the uh, inactive nodes and edges, and then we add some non-dominant inputs with the ratio zero to one. That's, that means that if we have uh, 10 uh, input input examples from the dominant class we will have uh, one i mean total one from the non-dominant class and let's say uh, the example will be better if we have 20 input examples from one then one from uh, non-dominant class one and one from non-dominant class two and we add some edges back to that there is two things can happen that either some of the edges are added or some of the edges been updated. Those edges are already present in the do, uh, dominant constant, but the, the value being updated when you try to add the non-dominant constants related edges. There's another approach we uh, use that uh, the only difference from the previous one, instead of using the uh, imbalance creation, this is uh, this problem is similar to the OA problem where the problem in uh, traditional uh, uh, machine learning problem OA problem is I mean, uh, classifying a single uh, uh, class and tell the other class or uh, all the other non-dominant class as a negative uh, classification. So here we all the difference we do is that inst uh, instead of the imbalance created, we do the same thing with the similar ratio. If we have a 10 uh, dominant uh, constants examples, we have five from the class one and five for class two. And so the there will be a balance between dominant constant and the non-dominant constant. We do the same thing. So another one is the higher priority negative example. So when we try what happens to we switch the uh, 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 sequence so instead of uh, giving the, the dominant constant first chance to add, I mean, add the edges and update the edges uh, we do for the how uh, non-dominant inputs and we that's what first we add the edges uh, uh, up, update the edges related to the non-dominant constant and then we add and update the edges for the dominant constant there's another approach we use that is the strong negative edges. Strong negative edges who are this similar to the uh, previous uh, previous examples. Only difference is that we don't add all the edges. We add only the edges that are strong edges. The meaning of the strong edges is that that contributes significantly towards the classification of the non-dominant constant. In this. Uh, of uh, sentence that significantly means that we experimented evaluated the value to be the at least uh, the acu I mean, uh, the output of the classification is at least 50 percent accu accuracy with i mean the predi prediction is at least 50 percent so we uh, add only those edges and connect that uh, node and update the edges as we did uh, before now till now uh, what we have is uh, a subgraph that has not all the edges and all not all the nodes related to, I mean, from the actual model. But the the next step is the constant modularization. Constant modular is a process of separating the parts of the monolithic model belonging to the constant into its own DNA model. Constant model is also involved constant channeling, where the effects of the non-dominant constant within the module are channeled appropriately. So from uh, here to, till now, what we have is a, uh, classification for 0, 1, and 2. From there, we want to build a binary classification that can say whether uh, uh, yes for a uh, dominant constant and no for a uh, non-dominant constant. So, there's two uh, approach uh, is there. So one is the channeling. Constant modularization uh, includes the abstraction of the non-dominant constant. In this approach, we propose an, uh, to abstract the non-dominant constant by combining the non-dominant nodes at the output level. So another uh, key idea here that we remove some irrelevant edges. By meaning the irrelevant edges here, the example with the module one, we identify edges with only connected to the non-dominant nodes that has no connection with the dominant constant. 
for if uh, like we get a couple of edges <coughs> uh, uh, nodes here like where is okay so this node is only connected with the non-dominant uh, node so we remove that node and remove the incident edges and uh, we keep on doing uh, for the other levels and uh, then do the channeling that actually uh, connects the non-dominant nodes into a single one. Now, uh, till now, what we have discussed is that we had the model, the DNN model, we did it 0 to 2. We uh, identified the constants. We, uh, after doing the constant identification, we built the functional constant. Then we bring back some of the non-dominant edges, and do we did the constant modularization where we uh, convert this problem into a binary problem, and finally we get the module for each of the constant for for here is the output class. Now uh, the experiments. For this experiment, we have used four data set. That is the English digit. Uh, all are very familiar with this data set, that MNIST data set. It has the uh, 0 to 9 handwritten and another very fa uh, uh, famous data set, that is fashion MNIST. Uh, the number of the class is same, 10. Only difference is that it has the images from different type of clause. There's another uh, data set has the Japanese digit uh, and that is also as it uh, 0 to 9. And another uh, data set we use that is uh, named as extended MNIST is English alphabet. But as our approach is based on the dense hidden layer, training a deep neural network model with only dense layer does not achieve high accuracy for this uh, alpha, uh, alphabet data set. To remedy that problem, fixing the number of output levels for all the data set under experiment, we take H to J, uh, the total 10 numbers of output classes from the data set, we continue our experiment. And in this experiment, we build 16 handmade models and uh, these models are trained with corresponding data set with 50 epoch and they have one, two, three, and four hidden layers. Each of them size is 49. And name of the data, uh, DNN models has been represented is the data set hyphen number of layers like MNIST4, a model that is created for MNIST data set with four hidden layers of size 49. And we uh, answer three research questions. How efficient are the decomposed modules? Does modularity in deep neural network enable reuse? Does modularity in deep neural network enable replacement? So to answer this question, we evaluate four different uh, uh, four different proposed uh, uh, techniques to identify the tangling constant. We utilize a best approach to accuracy, and we calculate Jack Adenius. I'll talk to you a little bit later. So what we do, we take the testing data set, we take the modules, and uh, calculate the mod uh, modular accu accuracy, that is the composed accuracy of the decomposed modules. And we carried the experiments on the, all the 16 and for the different approaches that for the tangling identification, we had four approaches and constant modularization, we have two approaches. Not, oh, I'm not getting into this table, I have uh, some key results here. So first in this approach, select the tangling identification approach which works for the best. We found that in case of accuracy, the strong negative edges does best for all of them. But when we tried to calculate jacket index between the modules, uh, what we tried to find here, I mean, how common are the modules? We found that the value uh, for the strong negative edges in the range of 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, but the best value we got for the higher priority negative, the value is around 0 0.1. So it means that the modules are re really different. But what happens there is that it became, again, the unary problem. When we, when we added only the negative example first than positive example, we got the information from that. Uh, if we go back to this uh, one, and if we, we can see in this, the most of the accuracy around 10%. So that means it can only calculate the accuracy for uh, accurately for one class, and uh, in fact, it can, it is irrespective of the type of input. It is saying yes for all of them. 
And now we find that with the model accuracy, and then we apply the channel modularization, and finally the phase two one was the removing the irrelevant edges. Then we find that the model uh, modules that perform the best in terms of accuracy for nine out of 16 cases and those it does not do is the difference between the model accuracy and module accuracy very low and the average difference of the accuracy we are actually gain 0.03 percent of accuracy overall so the next question is that does modularity in deep neural network enable reuse so here uh, what we try to do we uh, divide the experiment to two parts. One is the intradata set reuse and one is the interdata set reuse. In the intradata set reuse, we take the uh, model that been uh, <coughs> sorry uh, from this MNIST, for example, MNIST we take from zero from one uh, um, and one uh, another one uh, module from the same data set. I will briefly describe about the Actually, I will come back to the later, this one. So uh, English data set, for example, giving an example, English data set zero, English data set one we have. So we calculate modularized accuracy for inter data set reuse. And another one is the intra data set one, where the, we take the one module from the English data set, for example, one module from the Jap Japanese data set. We uh, build a uh, model, uh, model uh, to check the modulus accuracy so for comparing here uh, in this right now i can get into these uh, tables for comparing we trained a model with the similar example for example uh, in this intra data set we can take from zero and a we calculated that our result the modular is accuracy 74.8 when the trained model is 99.3 now going back here so the key insight here the, we found the inter data set reuse can help to gain 0.03 percent on average accuracy and inter data set actually loses accuracy around 8.28 percent on average and the 5.67 on median value and in giving the yeah, inter data set more detailed feedback uh, uh, findings like for when the intra one we did the MNIST to the MNIST there are 45 scenarios because 10 choose two so 80 is 80 percent of the scenario is more doing better where it is the 70 percent for almost 70 percent were fashion MNIST and EMNIST also doing like 80 percent of them doing better or the same the key in the performance a little bit worse if uh, 50 percent of the scenario model is doing better or the same and for the uh, reuse uh, uh, intra data set reusability, there is 100 scenarios. Like we take from zero from one uh, for EM, MNIST and EMNIST with uh, zero and from A from another data set, there will be 100 scenario, 10 cross 10. And so only five out of 100 case a module a modules perform the same or better, and we use the accuracy of 5.36. And the MNIST with KMNIST, similar 100 number of scenarios, and the average loss of accuracy 8.2. And so uh, this modularity in DNN enable the replacement. And so here we want to do, we replace a module with a set of a module decomposed from a deep neural network with, uh, with a module bit from same data set, but with different configuration. To evaluate this scenario, uh, the, here also we do two things, like the intra data set replacement, where we replace a single module with a module taken from a model uh, built with the same data set, but different configuration. We replace an intra data set, where we replace a module and, and from, uh, with uh, another module from a different data set. I will give you the how we did that. So let's take we have the D, a DNA module that is the interdata set module model A and model B that is uh, from the same data set but has the different configuration. So how we choose this is that we replace the model with the higher complexity in this term. Complexity means then a higher number of hidden layers. We form, for example, we take the MNIST one and replace our module with the uh, with MNIST 4 that has the four hidden layers. 
this is the intra data set replacement and the inter data set replacement we do i will take a model from a data set let's say english data set english digit data set and another model uh, from the japanese digit and we replace uh, nine or english with the nine from japanese uh, and we tell uh, we do the inter data set replacement what we have found that the inter data set replacement loses always a 0.76 percentage of the accuracy on average and uh, inter data set loses another 5.4 percent accuracy on average so going back to the uh, this there is uh, so, uh, various avenues we can work on and to enhance that uh, or uh, decompose uh, decomposition of deep neural network works. One is obviously increase in the performance, better decomposition techniques need, uh, would be needed because we have found that the, some of the cases like replacement, uh, their significant amount of accuracy being uh, reduced. And another one, the, currently the work is applying for the deep neural network with a certain assumption that uh, has the tense layer and the ReLU uh, as the uh, activation uh, for the hidden layer and the softmax for the uh, logic layer but we want to carry our work for the more complex and the realist uh, or more realistic uh, models like convolution neural network and finally unit testing on the deep neural network models can be explored so finishing my talk we will talk about the decomposition of deep neural network how we are doing the approach and we answer uh, uh, three research questions like how efficient are the decomposed modules and does modularity in deep neural enable reuse and does modularity in the uh, TNN uh, enable replacement so thank you for uh, just giving me this opportunity to present my work and I'd love to have, have some feedback and any comments and yeah thank you all thank you Rangit and if there are any questions uh, uh, maybe uh, because we have time, we can uh, just use the microphone. Hi, uh, th th this is Nock. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I, I have a, a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, how do you expect the, the result to generalize? So you use uh, specific uh, variations of in this data set to answer the three questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I have totally different uh, set of, of, of data, let's say I want to do the prediction of whether pedestrian would cross the road. Do you think that your answer to the three questions would generalize to other problem or it's just specific to this endless data set? Uh, no, so the concept here is can be generalized into the other aspect, even for the email related additional problems. But the current work that we have is, uh, is what's for the dnn with the image classification problems uh, so uh, there is a uh, future works needed to go this work to uh, have the implementation uh, available for the ml problem that you uh, talked about the, whether the page general cross the road or not okay sorry let me be more specific so let's say uh, in the uh, lower left corner uh, column Right, you say that intra data set reuse can help gain 0.03 percent mm -hmm. average accuracy. Mm -hmm. Right. So my question is, let's say if I apply this to a totally different uh, set of data, do you think the gain would still be 0 0.03 or something around this region, or it would be, you know, totally different? I mean, uh, I do think it won't be that much different, but I don't have any data to back it up for now. Okay. And but uh, if what I said, if it can be applied for others work in mean, other area of deep neural network, it should work. And there is not much difference because the concept here is the how the decomposition, how the constant identification or the uh, tangling identification constant model, uh, channeling. The overall concept is the same. Uh, it will remain the same, but the uh, implementation will have to be different. And that's what the uh, difference of the accuracy might be where if the implementation part and overall generally i don't think there won't be big difference but again saying i don't have the data to back it up right now okay cool. so 
this is Ali. I have also a question. Can I ask? So, just uh, the first question. I have uh, two questions. First question is that: uh, Can you explain the model that you had? So, what kind of DNA you had? So, I guess you had kind of MLP model. So, kind of three layers, or how many layers you have? Okay, so that's what I. Okay, so and going back to the slides. Okay, so here we already talked out that we had the 16 handmade models. We did experiments with the varying the number of layers. Uh, that has the one hidden layer, two hidden layers, three hidden layers, four hidden layers. And since these are data sets are mostly canonical, and the accuracy testing accuracy of the model with even one hidden layer is pretty good. So. Uh, answering your question, we uh, have the four different variation of the hidden layer and with the four different numbers and all for the all the four data sets. So in total, we have 16 different combinations. Okay, great. I would say that's great. Of course, if you uh, extend your work to generalize for different kind of model, it would be really nice and also very interesting work. So then my next question is that you, you only consider here accuracy, yeah? So that was the only concern. So may I ask if I have other concern like size of my net, network, I have some constraint, how would be that this modular modularization would helpful on that? Did you think about that? Or so if I have multi-goal like that, so the size of so, network uh, is also very so important. Size of network, yes, that's a really good question actually. Uh, so we didn't uh, measure for the, all of them, but we find that the, again, the jacket index that was where for the difference between the modules. And if we just go into, yep. So jacket index was the how different the modules in between among themselves. And we have one experiment that is not in this table, but in the, paper, we found that the average jacket index with the model and the module, we found that the value is around 0 0.7 that I remember. So it's, uh, there is significant amount of difference between the DNA model and the module we have created from that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think Jiang Wang had, had a question. I saw his hand go up and then uh, Jiang Wang. Um, hi, Zhu, uh, uh, Drew, go ahead. Yeah, so while you're on the slide, actually, I had a question about the performance. So I wasn't sure whether I got your message here. Is the message that so, so the performance, I mean, from a learning point of view, the performance actually drops, right? Am I correct? Um, from learning point of view, can you please a little bit? Like, like the baseline model, like the top four rows are the baseline models, right? Uh, top four, so this, this is the model accuracy. Right, but but these are the baseline models without your your uh, uh, modu yeah. modularization. No, my, then, yeah. you, th then you put in your modularization technique, the perform the accuracy actually drops a little bit, right? Uh, accuracy, I mean, if you go back to this slide, so, uh, Yes, it uh, uh, drops a little bit, but the average accuracy is not in this slide. So average accuracy difference is 0.03% gain oh. overall. You actually gain performance. Yeah, gain performance. that is a very uh, trivial number, but it's a little bit gain. At least we can say it's not uh, losing that much. We lose actually for when you do replacement. Okay, I see. I see. Okay. That, that's something that wasn't very clear to me uh, in, in this sort of pre, pretty crowded slide. That's one question. The other question was, I think it's somehow related to the questions we got from Milk and, uh, and Ali. My question is more on the architectural level. So the way you described it is multi, it's ML, MLP kind of architecture and you, you showed it on MNIST family. So presumably it works, on, works well on convolutional type of architectures. But how do you see your technique working on other type of, let's say, the recurrent architectures? I see it might have a hard time. So might be I haven't thought about the, that portion till now. I'm working on the CNL implementation, but that would okay. be a really good question. I will get back to you. Okay. 
I think for to make your technique sort of to make a stronger claim in the future. I mean, I'm sure you 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 know you got a good, good paper out of this, but if you want to claim a stronger contribution, I think you have to address recurrent architecture yes. to to yes. to be able to claim something about uh, you know deep architectures in general, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Then then I have two very small comments on presentation. One is that you brought up Microsoft Research. I don't. I mean, the paper was only based between you and, and your advisor, right? So I'm not sure whether it's so that's worthy. That's an introduction of myself. It will only be in the actual presentation. That's, I right. So I, I I don't think it's necessary to bring in Microsoft Research since they didn't make any contribution here. The other thing is, I mean, you showed some pseudo uh, code. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Other people could disagree with me, but I, my impression is that. At least of all the talks that I that I that I've gone to in a in a conference presentation, nobody has the time to read a pseudo code. Okay. So, so if you can just use your visual artifacts to explain your algorithms, there's really no need to present the sure. pseudo code. Sure, definitely. Yeah, it's just just my two cents. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Yes, uh, well, I think this is Ray has a Ray has a question. She has a. Way? Yeah, yes. Hi, this is a way. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting idea. Um, can, can you share a little bit inside behind your assumption? So your assumption is deep neural network, you can modulize it, mm -hmm. right? So does that mean some weights are more useful for certain classes? Not all the weights are equivalent. Not to all the weights, exactly. Okay, and uh, you believe that's general for all the your networks based yes. on I mean, that's my belief not i mean i have don't have the again uh, uh, the implementation of other uh, neural networks but my belief is should be even there are some works not related to the uh, decomposite but uh, modular training also there is a bunch of work there that's where the training they do modularly by doing a training for a single class and they keep on I uh, hierarchical way they build the training. Sure. Uh, what about reusability? You believe this part can be reused because there's some similarity between the problem or? Uh, so that's what, exactly, that's what was my key thing is that we kind of did good when we did the intra data set reuse, but not that good when we did the intra data set. That's what is the similarity between the problems will give a better result for CO, but if the problems is not similar, then uh, it won't be as good as uh, the model. Okay, thank you. So other questions, please? So I have a, a short comment probably. I guess probably Ranjit, you know that there are two interesting work, NAS, so-called Neural Architectural Search, and Efficient Net. They're using kind of a machine learning method or also even neural network method to find the best architecture for a problem, for a given requirement. So I was thinking that you may use also for this decomposability problem and modularization that you do. Maybe you could also use of deep neural network and generalize your problem, your, your work like that. So that means if you are able to have to, I would say, of course, it's a little bit challenging, but if you were able to use also deep neural network for your own work and generalize to find the modular, to just propose a modularization via, via machine learning technique would be also interesting. So because now you're trying, but your work is you have, you have a kind of assumption, you're also working on a very specific data set and also a specific network. But those work like NAS or EfficientNet, they are working on, a, they are also general, generalized for all different kind of architectures. So if you get some ideas from those work, maybe it would be interesting to see that if you can apply your modularization for example, using those techniques, which is already in NAS or in efficient net, that would be great. That's a, uh, that's a really great comment. I will definitely uh, check and I will get back to you with my comments also. Yeah, it would be interesting to check yeah, it. I would sure, if you want to generalize. We can chat later also. Yeah. So if um, if there are any other question, either you can okay. just use the microphone or. Or uh, said, type uh, in chat. Uh, Professor Myra said she will give me some feedback. Okay. Sure. Yes, uh, this is Jonathan Smith. Um, 
I was a little confused uh, during your talk, the way you use the concept of a module, because I was expecting it to be a breakup of the depth rather than the breadth. But really, um, I guess the way you're using the word module is, for those of us who teach in Canvas, the way they use the word module in Canvas, you just teach a little bit of the information in pieces. I don't know if there's a better way to express this distinction between a um, breakup of the depth, which is what I would normally think about modules in a program, and the breakup of the breadth across the range of training that you're doing. Yes, definitely true. I mean, we actually, uh, Dr. Ryan and we had this talk earlier about the hierarchical decomposition. So instead of breakup in the breadth, yes, that would be very nice and uh, to do I mean uh, to pick up uh, in different approach so we are at, uh, that's the kind of future where I have it in mind uh, too okay that's good to know yeah I'll be interested to see how that works out uh, yeah. for you exactly the same discussion we had earlier with Dr. Rajan thank you Thank you very much, Rangit. Um, and again, if uh, if uh, anyone has questions, um, uh, Rangit, um, if you could put up the slide that has your contact information, uh, folks can yes, um, uh, can reach out to you. Yes, um, Rangit, that, that I said, I will just yep. yeah. Um, and or maybe you can put it in the chat. Yep. Uh, he will look forward to um, comments on uh, both the technical content um, as well as the. Um, as well as the presentation. And, and of course, uh, both of us are looking forward to future collaboration on this topic. Um, thank you again, everybody. And um, uh, at this point, I will adjourn the, uh, the TARDS Lunch and Learn. Uh, next week, uh, we have an external speaker. Uh, we, uh, Vipin Kumar uh, from the University of uh, Minnesota. He will be talking about uh, physics-guided machine learning um, uh, I will be sending out um, a note. Well, Bridget will be sending out a note. Um, if you can circulate within your department, um, uh, this uh, I uh, I think that this is going to be a pretty interesting talk. Thanks very much, and uh, and have a good rest of the uh, day, everybody. Bye bye now. Thank you.